One of the more interesting realizations near the end of the book is that these seven characters, uh, named after days of the week, reflect uh, their creation account, or reflect the biblical creation account. And we see this on page 147, when uh, Simon is told to get dressed. The valet says, you have your clothes here. Um, and uh, it says, the servant lifted off a kind of ottoman, a long peacock blue drapery, rather of the nature of a domino, on the front of which was emblazoned a large golden sun, in which was splashed here and there with flaming stars and crescents. And the valet then says, you're to be dressed as Thursday. And Syme says he has no clue what's going on. He doesn't understand this. Why um, should I be particularly like Thursday in a green frock spotted all over with the sun and moon? Those orbs, I think, shine on other days. I once saw the moon on Tuesday, I remember. Beg pardon, sir, said the valet. Bible also provided for you. Uh, and he gives him the Bible and he points him to that chapter in Genesis. And it says, Syme read it wondering. It was in that, it was that in which the fourth day of the week is associated with the creation of the sun and moon. Here, however, they reckoned from a Christian Sunday. What does that mean? Well, in the the Hebrew account, of course, the first day of the week would have been Sunday with uh, the Sabbath on Saturday. Here, since Sunday is the Christian Sabbath, the days would have started on Monday, and so Thursday is the fourth day of the week. And of course, on the fourth day of the week is when we get the naming of the sun and the moon and the stars. And what Syme goes on to say is, at the very end of this, uh, the narrator says, For these disguises did not disguise, but reveal. And so it draws our attention to the fact that these particular disguises, if you will, this uh, dress that they are to wear, these clothes that they are to wear uh, to dinner, are reflective of the creation account and um, have something meaningful to say about each of these characters. And so I think we're meant to take this symbolically and to extend that symbolism further in the book. And so uh, there's some, some interesting things that happen over the course of this story that perhaps suggest that that's exactly what Chesterton means for us to do. So an example of that would be, for instance, the Marquis de St. Eustache, um, Expector Radcliffe, um, as he comes to be revealed, uh, who is Wednesday. And, of course, Wednesday is the day where we see vegetation um, sprouting up everywhere. And so um, we get that picture in chapter 14 as well when he comes down and, and Syme remarks um, that he sees all of the vegetation growing. Uh, but you may remember that when Syme goes to fight the duel against... Um, against the marquee that we actually have some really uh, beautiful pictures of vegetation. So uh, if you go to page 95, for instance, uh, as they begin the fight, it says, He felt a strange and vivid value in all the earth around him, in the grass under his feet. He felt the love of life in all living things. He could almost fancy that he heard the grass growing. He could almost fancy that even as he stood, fresh flowers were springing up and breaking into blossom in the meadow. Flowers, blood red and burning gold and blue, fulfilling the whole pageant of the spring. And whenever his eyes strayed for a flash from the calm, staring, hypnotic eyes of the Marquis, they saw the little tuft of almond tree against the skyline. He had the feeling that if by some miracle he escaped, he would be ready to sit forever before that almond tree, desiring nothing else in the world. And there's other uh, explanations within this passage, but that, that entire paragraph is talking about the fact that he can even hear the grass growing, and he's talking about flowers springing up from the ground, which is the kind of language that we get of the vegetation growth on day of three of creation. And so in some ways, his encounter with the marquee reflects that third day of creation. We actually get something similar then on page 115 with the secretary. The secretary reflects Monday. Um, again, he gets referenced in... Uh, chapter 14 about wearing this uh, black suit with the uh, the bright white uh, light um, across his um, torso. And so uh, Syme remarks there again, 
that he recalled um, that the first day was uh, the creation of light. Well, in a really fascinating yet subtle way on page 115, you may recall when uh, it seems as though everyone um, on the Anarchist Council, other than Sunday uh, and Monday, uh, are actually detectives, that Monday the secretary is chasing them um, through the streets, and they're trying to get away, and at one point, as he's on a horse, they get the car started, and it actually knocks the, secre the secretary, this is on page 115, it plucked the secretary clean out of his saddle as a knife is whipped out of its sheath, trailed him kicking terribly for 20 yards, and left him flung flat upon the road and far in front of his frightened horse. As the car took the corner of the street with a splendid curve, they could just see the other anarchists filling the street and raising their fallen leader. And what I find fascinating is that after the secretary has been knocked to the ground and dragged for 20 feet, the professor says, I can't understand why it has grown so dark. And I think there's meant to be a subtle joke there by Chesterton that it's when the secretary, who represents the creation of light, goes down that darkness envelops them uh, more significantly. And there's a number of other things that we could do as we go through. Um, perhaps there's some ways in which we talk about Gogol, who is Tuesday, um, and the way that uh, he separates uh, his beard from his face um, as the thing that is most markedly not uh, normal about him. You remember the anarchists all had something about them that didn't fit. Um, and as Gogol then is also the first one to be separated from the group, there's something there perhaps about the separation of the waters from the waters, like on day two. Or perhaps Syme, uh, who's described not as having blonde hair, as many people think, but his hair is described throughout the novel as yellow. Perhaps the yellow hair actually reflects um, the sun. Moreover, uh, Syme, you may remember, appears for the first time uh, in Saffron Park on the night of this strange sunset and of course has this impossibly good news at the end of the novel with the sunrise he comes out from the anarchist meeting and it talks about how the moonlight that night looked rather like a, a sick sunshine and so even the ways that Syme and the landscape are, de are described around him at key moments when he first shows up when he wakes up at the end and when he moves as the uh, undercover anarchist um, in, in chapter 4 there, um, that Syme reflects the sun and the moon of day 4. Uh, we could then begin to explore whether there's anything about um, Dr. Bull, the scientist, and Saturday uh, as a reflection of the creation of animals and even something about him that's decidedly human uh, and inhuman with his spectacles. And then, of course, the question about the professor and if there are some ways that the professor reflects uh, the creation of the, the birds and the fish. But certainly what we find is that Sunday absolutely defines himself, not just describes himself, but defines himself as the Sabbath, as the peace of God. And so I think there's something fascinating about what Chesterton is doing with linking each of these characters with the creation days, and then in some ways each character embodying the characteristics of that day. Now, there's more that we could talk about there, and I'd encourage you to explore that on your own, but I think there's one additional thing that's going on, and I'll hint at it here, and then we're going to explore this in more detail. Uh, but there are a number of parallels in this book between The Man Who Was Thursday and the book of Job. And in fact, Chesterton writes elsewhere of his uh, affinity for, his love for the book of Job. He actually writes, one of his essays is, is like an introduction to the book of Job. And so Chesterton was certainly fond of the book of Job, but there are actually a number of parallels to the book of Job. And one of those is at the beginning of the book of Job, where it talks about Job's seven sons, and they would hold a feast in his house, uh, each one for his own day. And so some people suggest that that's birthdays, that each one had it for his birthday. But the number seven perhaps suggests the idea that each son had a day of the week at which he would host the family for dinner. And so there's this perspective even that each one of these characters embodies the seven sons of Job uh, in some kind of mysterious manner. And we get this revealing of who Sunday is 
uh, with the feast. And so having the feast in his home with the seven children uh, alone is a pretty interesting parallel. But in the next lecture, when we talk about the book of Job and you see all of these other parallels, I think you're going to find that that's a much stronger connection than you believed. And then we'll explore why those connections to Job are so significant.